Ah, the stadium, truly a melting pot of culture, from the dad taking his son to the local hockey game to the fanatical superfan who will do anything for their favorite team. Stadiums are a landmark feature of almost every city on planet Earth, but not all stadiums are created equal. Some are brilliant pieces of urban planning and architecture, and some are Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. In this video, we'll look at examples of really well-designed stadiums and contrast them to terribly built ones. Before we start, please consider subscribing. It's free and it helps out a ton. Thanks and on to the video. Some stadiums and sports venues are really well integrated into the city they're in. For example, let's look at a Mercedes-Benz Arena in Berlin, Germany. The stadium serves multiple purposes, such as hosting concerts and events, but its primary purpose is hosting the Eisbären Berlin hockey team and Elba Berlin basketball team. At first glance, you can see the notable absence of an ocean of parking. There are a few parking garages, but overall, parking is pretty minimal. It's obvious that the planners of this stadium intended you to take transit or walk to the venue because of the proximity to housing and the city in general and the location of train, metro and bus stops near the stadium. In my opinion, this is the right way to design a stadium. Provide some parking for the people who have to drive, like disabled people, some of which need to drive, but design the venue around walking, biking and transit. Let's look at another example. In 2024, Paris is going to host the Summer Olympics. Before we get into that, please excuse my pronunciation of French names. Take this as payback for Napoleon invading Bohemia and crushing us at the Battle of Austerlitz 200 years earlier. Paris is making preparations for the games, and a lot of these preparations include building new stadiums and transit infrastructure. For example, the Olympic Village, where the athletes will be housed for the duration of the games, will be located in Saint-Denis, a suburban town north of Paris. Several tram lines and a metro line run to Saint-Denis, making transit access easy and convenient. The games will be spread out over the city of Paris, the Ile-de-France region which surrounds the French metropolis, and some events will be held in other regions of France. New and existing stadiums for the games will be located at or near public transit stops. To help cope with the additional traffic from the Olympics and the growing city as a whole, Paris is investing billions of euros into transit and cycling initiatives, such as the Grand Paris Express. It's clear that these games were designed with transit in mind. This trend of taking Paris back from cars truly kicked off in 2014 with the election of Anne Hidalgo as the mayor of Paris. Representing the Socialist Party, her policies center around removing parking spaces, making Paris a 100% cyclable city by 2026 and generally giving back public space to people instead of cars. The 2024 Olympics are being used as a catalyst for public transport and cycling development. Back to the aforementioned Grand Paris Express, the GPE is a plan for a massive extension of the Paris metro system. The project involves building 68 new metro stations, which will be served by 4 new metro lines and 2 extensions to existing lines. The goal of the extension is to better connect Paris and the surrounding Ile-de-France region. Other public transit service is supposed to be expanded, and shuttles will be established through different sports venues. To get to the events farther away from Paris, attendees will be able to use the high-speed TGV trains or regular trains where there isn't high-speed service. In my opinion, the 2024 Paris Olympic developments deserve an S-tier placement. Stepping away from Europe for a moment, let's look at the land of cookie-cutter suburbs and Ford F69420 urban tanks, the USA. One rare example of a great stadium in the US is Madison Square Garden in New York City. The stadium is centrally located, sitting in the middle of Manhattan. It isn't surrounded by a Pacific Ocean of parking, and there are multiple transit stops stopping near and at the stadium, including the famous Penn Station, which is located underneath the stadium. The stadium integrates well into the urban fabric of New York City, and in my opinion, is an overall benefit for the city. I give Madison Square Garden a solid A-tier placement, not the best, but definitely one of the greatest American stadiums. This, this thing, is Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. Now, looking at this thing, what do you think first when you see it? I'd say that this looks like a result of someone trying to make the world's largest asphalt frying pan, and then the city decided to put a stadium on top of it. This stadium really includes all the circles of urbanism hell. 
car dependency, a square fuck meter of asphalt around it and almost no public transport except for the Dodgers Express bus service, but even that is flawed. There are no bus lanes around Dodger Stadium, meaning that the bus gets stuck in traffic just like any other car. Solid D-tier stadium, the only thing that saves it from being F-tier is the Dodger Express bus service. A slightly better stadium is FedEx Field near Washington DC. It's still a solid D-tier venue with the absolute ocean of car parking around it and the lack of any public transport option except for some shuttle service. However, in contrast to Dodger Stadium, at least you can take the metro decently near the stadium and then walk a mile. The walk isn't ideal since the trip is quite long and it's along a four-lane road, but at least you get a sidewalk. The last example of a bad sports complex are the stadiums of the Rio 2016 Summer Olympics. From an urbanism perspective, they aren't the worst. Bus rapid transit lines run to the stadiums, and the stadiums are relatively well integrated into the city. The problems start appearing when you look at the social and maintenance aspects of the stadiums. First of all, many people, and especially poor people, have been evicted from their homes to build the new venues. A lot of the infrastructure had to be built from scratch, and the city decided to get rid of poor neighborhoods, also known as favelas, for this purpose. The most well-known example of this is the case of Villa Autodromo, a poor neighborhood that was supposed to be demolished to make way for the Olympic venues and infrastructure. In the end, after a hard-fought battle, the city agreed to modernize the district and to build new housing for the residents there, but only after a considerable part of the population left. Those who weren't evicted or weren't so lucky as the few remaining residents of Villa Autodromo have been hidden from the views of international tourists by sound barriers and public transit cuts. In the end, the evictions, the destruction of multiple favela districts and the suffering caused didn't really achieve much. The games came and went and most of the stadiums are now abandoned. Some venues are being turned into schools and other amenities six years after they were abandoned. Gotta start somewhere, I suppose. However, most stadiums and other developments constructed for the games are still sitting empty and abandoned. This trend of building new, shiny, expensive stadiums and infrastructure for major sporting events and then leaving it underused or abandoned isn't unique to Rio. For example, when Brazil hosted the 2014 FIFA World Cup, a stadium in the capital city of Brasilia was refurbished at a massive price. The games were played and now the stadium serves as a bus parking lot. Overall, I give the Rio 2016 Olympic stadiums a D tier because of the social destruction they caused, ultimately all for nothing, after the 2016 Olympics ended. In conclusion, stadiums and sports developments can be a catalyst for great city developments, but they can also be extremely destructive, like in 2016 in Rio. Thank you so, so much for watching to the end, this has been Tramley and I'll see you next time, bye!